fall on a static rope. Dynamic ropes are designed to be stretchy and catch a climbing fall, and static ropes are designed to either ascend or repel or haul a bag. But what happens if you fall on it? <coughs> yes? You're not, so, you're not supposed to whip on static ropes. I, I agree, but like I was on El Capitan in the winter without bivy gear, just in a day project, and our dynamic rope got stuck and all we had left was a static rope to work with. You're not supposed to do that. I'd still be stuck up there if we... Never mind. There, I talked to an alpine climber once and he had to use a static rope to lead climb with to get themselves out of a pickle that was unforeseen. Well, they aren't doing it right. I said unforeseen. And I had my canyon buddy had to climb out of a canyon once because they had an emergency and all they ever have is a static rope. Then they need to carry dynamic rope with them then. Well, you clearly have never been canyoning if you think you're supposed to be taking dynamic ropes down those. I did a video where Dick's Sporting Good had a dirty return. The person got in the mail a static rope instead of a dynamic one like they ordered. And if they didn't know that, they would have fallen on a static rope. And I'm curious what would have happened if they did. Yeah, my... Shh, 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 we get it. Don't do this, okay? Now, before I show you the test, let's say the baseline for what a dynamic rope does. When you're just hanging your weight from it, if you're 300 pounds, it'll have a 10% stretch from you just sitting on it. And if you take a fall at six kilonewtons, it will stretch 30%. Now, you're not likely to get six kilonewtons as we've done some climbing whippers in the gym. And we have seen that a climber will see in a fall like that around two kilonewtons on them and around four kilonewtons on the quick draw. And the highest force we ever got in a gym fall test was 4.4 kilonewtons when Tanner, who's 290 pounds, took a whipper and his quick draw saw around seven-ish kilonewtons. 716. <laughs> now you definitely need to understand fall factors before you take any of these numbers to the grave is a fall factor is how far you're falling compared to the length of rope you have in the system. So if you're in a gym, you the rope's going up to the quick draw and down to you, and your feet, let's say, are at the quick draw, you're only falling 10 feet, but you have 30 feet of rope in the system. That's a 0.33 factor fall. A lot of the forces people are actually concerned about is when you do a, full, a fall factor of one, where if you were to fall five feet with only five feet of rope in the system, or 50 feet, with 50 feet of rope in the system. They actually generate, spoiler alert, I think the same number. And I have that video coming out soon after I can do a few more tests to verify that. Now the forces we got were still pretty gnar, but keep in mind, they would be more gnar if you were falling next to your belayer and had 10 feet of slack in the rope. Fun fact, your quick draw, if you were to take a fall, sees zero kilonewtons if you took a fall factor one and you started climbing at the ground. Get it? Because you're falling the full length, your ankles see all the force? Never mind. Anyways, the highest forces you're likely to get is either falling on your personal anchor or falling before you get your first piece in on the second pitch. So our tests are on the drop tower. We are using 200 pounds of steel weight. We bolted the Grigri to the post so we had a consistent belayer and we tied a knot about one fist away from the Grigri so we could make sure that the rope wasn't slipping through and throwing our number off. Sucked up a pinky width. And we lifted that tie-in point to the dummy about where the hypothetical feet would be if it was climbing above its last quick draw. To have something to compare to, we started with a Sterling 9.8 dynamic rope. The anchor saw 7.31 kilonewtons and that climber saw 4.49, which is almost identical to what Tanner, who's 290 pounds, saw, but maybe that's the difference between a steel weight and a body, but at least we have something to compare to for our next tests, as all the other things are internally consistent. This is a BL Spilinium 10.0 semi-static nylon rope. This rope is what I will haul bags up El Capitan with. It's not 100% static, it is semi-static. At 300 pounds just sitting on it, it stretches 4%, and if you have a six kilonewton fall on this, it has only 15% stretch, so about half of our dynamic rope. So we got 10.7 kilonewtons on the anchor and 6.07 on the climber, which is about 35 to 50% more than our dynamic rope. That's what the graph looks like. Now force is not the entire picture here, it's force over time, let me explain. When I tried to desheath the rope in the micro traction video, I got four and a half kilonewtons on my body and it hurt, like a lot, I didn't want to keep going. 
But when I did a 700 foot rope swing, then I got five kilonewtons on my body and it didn't hurt because it took so long to get to that force. Now, if you start getting eight or nine kilonewtons on your body, it's gonna start to break. And even six kilonewtons that we got on this is gonna hurt a lot because you didn't really have enough time in the equation. So would I risk whipping on a semi-static rope if I'm gonna get six kilonewtons on my body? Well, no, I would try to avoid the six kilonewtons. If maybe they had an ATC and they jumped while I fell or they were lighter than me and I'm halfway up the pitch and I only fall like 10 feet, then yeah, it's still gonna hurt, but there's ways to like mitigate the pain if you like are in a pickle. But if your climber is hanging at a hanging belay and the fall factor is one or two and you fall twice as far as you have rope in the system, hell no. The Imlay Canyon Arrow 9.2 polyester static row is 2% stretch when you have 300 pounds on this and only 4% stretch when you have six kilonewtons on it. So it's half as stretchy or twice as static, depending on how you look at it, as the last rope we tested. And we got 16.24 kilonewtons on the anchor and 9.57 on the climber. That would have hurt. Oh, that would hurt your body. Is that why we don't do human testing on things like this? Okay, so your back would break. Good to know. But let's talk about the gear real quick. Bolts are typically strong enough, but hangers start to bend around eight kilonewtons. And so you would have a bent hanger. Your carabiner wouldn't necessarily break yet, but if it wasn't a bolt and you had a nut or a cam in, is likely going to come out between eight and 12 kilonewtons, and you would uh, blow that piece of gear and fall in your next one, generating even more force. We repeated this test and we got 16.92 kilonewtons on the anchor and 9.62 on the climber, so it was very similar to our first test. And two samples is considered a large data set when it's a pain in the ass to keep resetting the drop tower. Super sciencey enough. But a fun fact, this rope is rated for 22 kilonewtons. And when I put a clove hitch to a clove hitch, when I was measuring stretch in the machine, I broke it at 10.5 kilonewtons. In that shortfall, our climber got 9.62. So if it fell any further, it would have broken this rope. Rope strength ratings don't really holistically give you an understanding of your rope and neither does looking at a channel's view and subscriber count. I am a growing channel and it is exciting, uh, but I still need patrons as the lifeblood of this channel to get this lab the way it needs to be and to get these videos the way I know they should be. And I appreciate those who have helped me get to this point. Our next rope is a Sterling C4 Canyon rope. And this has a Technora sheath and a polypropylene core. So it's very abrasion resistant, 2% stretch at 300 pounds and 8% stretch at six kilonewtons, which is a little bit stretchier than our last rope, but we did do our own stretch pull test and we did get a little bit lower force, so it checks out. Now I'm not saying this thing is safe. We did get 9.68 kilonewtons at the anchor and our climber got 5.83. Now the only thing I can think of is it slipped in the gree gree, yeah. but the knot didn't even come close. Nope. But then when we tested it again, we got 11.83 kilonewtons and then seven kilonewtons on the climber. Sucked up a pinky width. Remember that fall factor thing? Before we did this test, I put a rope, uh, it's just straight, eight to eight, and I wanted to put the line scale three at the bottom, 1280 hertz, and compare it to see if we were getting that peak force, and they were reading the same, but with our 10,000 hertz load cell, the S-beam mounted to the drop tower. And when we did that, that was a fall factor one, and guess what? It broke the rope, and that just shows you how bad this really is when you actually do a fall factor one. But was the load cell fast enough? If you were wondering if- Your hertz isn't high enough. Then we got some bonus material in here for you. A hertz, in case you were wondering, is how many times per second someone leaves an unhelpful comment. Someone posted in our first Gym Falls video that our sample rate wasn't fast enough to get the peak forces because the line scale three only read at 40 hertz per second. Now, if the force you got only lasted for a microsecond, and your load cell is only reading every so often, and it missed this peak force, and you read, let's say, six kilonewtons, but the real force was 10, that data needs to be right. So how fast does a load cell need to be in order to capture the peak force of a climbing fall with a dynamic rope? The S-beam load cell that we have mounted to the drop tower 
reads at 10,000 times per second. And after a drop, we would look at the spreadsheet and count all the cells that had the peak force in it and then divided that number by 10,000. This is my software I use for averaging numbers. It's called my finger. If only four cells had the peak force, you would need 2,500 hertz to pick up the data. If the peak force was consistent over 180 cells, then you would only need 56 hertz in order to not have missed that peak force. So you wanna know how many hertz you need in order to capture a dynamic rope fall? 23, 23 is less than 40. It was super good enough. But the good news is that one comment really steered making the line scale 3 1280 hertz, which works out because you do need a faster load cell to test the static ropes. And with a fresh knot and the green in the system and all things considered, we only need anywhere between 36 and 85 hertz in order to have not missed any of the peak forces in the tests you saw in this video. But when we were comparing the two load cells, we dropped the same rope with the same knots over and over and over. And when we did do that fall factor one, it required 550 hertz in order to capture that super short peak when that thing broke. Which, by the way, is faster than the Rock Exotic Enforcer, which is why we designed the Line Scale 3 to be 1280 hertz. So you can do almost everything you need to do except steel cable. If you subscribe and hit the bell, you will be notified when I post the video where I break a Line Scale 3 and a Rock Exotic Enforcer making it one of the most expensive episodes I've ever made. And even though 100 hertz would have captured everything I needed for this episode, I run these at 1280 hertz whenever I'm dropping stuff. And you can go to the blog and see all of our data there. Anyways, please don't whip on static ropes. This is just fun information for you to share with your buddy next time you go climbing. But there is one place where I did break the rules like an artist because I knew them like a pro. I did a 700 foot rope swing with mostly Beal Splenium 10.0 semi-static rope in the system, the rope that we tested in this video.